And I'm pleased to have with me today, uh, Chief Brendan Mitchell and Angelina Amaral. And they'll be joining me in just a moment here at the podium. But first, Chief Brendan Mitchell of the Halipu, uh, sorry, ha Halibu, thank you, Halibu First Nation, and now also Interim Regional Chief of the Assembly of First Nations Newfoundland, is here with us today, along with Angelina Amaral, Special Projects and Research Lead for the AFN Office of the Regional Chief, Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. A warm welcome to you both. I am offering each of you this tobacco for your presentation and insight today regarding the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the actions our municipal members can commit to in order to advance it here. Oh, thank you. I had to get a lesson on how to use this thing, first of all. At work, they tell me I'm a cell phone and computer challenged, and I am. Anyway, we'll get through this somehow. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm really grateful to be with you today here in Gander. And I think about municipalities and mayors and deputy mayors and councillors, administrative staff. I commend you on the great work you're doing on behalf of people of your communities and the prosperity of your communities generally. And in so doing, you're making a great contribution to the province of Newfoundland and Labrador while you do that. So I have tremendous respect for what you do. You put yourself forward in a public office, and sometimes it's an easy day, and sometimes days are hard when people in your communities come at you with their own concerns and issues, and they want you to take care of it for them right away. Something like being the chief of Hollywood First Nation, get all kinds of calls, and people are complaining about something. But... Most days are pretty good, and I bet in your own roles, most days are good for you also. I'm really honored to be here today with Angelina Amaral and Risha Knott. These ladies have been involved with a program to spread the word, to create awareness, information, have under people understand what the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous People really means, and what it means to people in Newfoundland and Labrador. I'll share something with you that you may not even be aware of. If I was asked a few people probably right in front of me here, I won't do it to you. How many indigenous people are there in Newfoundland and Labrador? I don't know what number you'd say, but unbelievably, believably, 120,000 people, more than one fifth of the population of Newfoundland. And there are a lot. When I consider the, the people who enrolled in Halibut or tried to enroll in Halibut First Nation, the self-identified as being Mi'kmaq in our process, 103,000. And if I add in Con River, Mobile First Nation, 800 people in the community, another 2,000 members at other places around the island, maybe elsewhere in Canada. If I include the 6,000 members of the Tulukovit Community Council in Southern Labrador, Todd Russell is their president. Some of you may know him. And I take the Inu Nation and Sheshishi and Natwishish, another 4,000 thereabouts, and a similar number of people for the Natsibut. Add it all up, it comes to about 120,000 people who have said, I am indigenous. So what does it mean to your communities? You probably have many people in your communities who are of indigenous background and you don't even know it, but they're there. And in our province for years, many people kept their history, their origins, their heritage, their family backgrounds to themselves for fear of discrimination and racism and other things. But times are changing right now for people. I say to people, we change the way people view us by changing the way we view ourselves first. Think about that. We change the way people view us by changing the way we view ourselves first. The way that indigenous people in Newfoundland and Labrador and across this country are viewing themselves today is a lot different than it was 50 years ago, 30 years ago, yes, and 10 years ago. There's a greater sense of pride today for indigenous people, a greater sense of self-respect, a greater sense of wanting to move forward positively and progressively. And yes, a greater sense of strength and courage as Indigenous people. We see it happen all the time. In my work at the national level at the Assembly of First Nations, we recently talked about this. The times are changing for Indigenous people in this country. It's like the Newfoundland song, the time they are changing. So it is getting different, it's getting better. And look out for the next 10 years. Even in your own roles, your own communities, the next 10 years will be really prosperous and big for people in Newfoundland and Labrador. 
You know, I look at the theme of your own event. It looks to the future. I attended the event here last week in this very room, dealing with the mining industry in central Newfoundland particularly. A lot of conversation around gold, gold mining, and other precious materials. I looked at the wind energy prospects for this province. You hear a lot of that, especially on the West Coast, and it's not always great. It does create some controversy, this wind energy thing. But when I say to people, we have to do something because we can't rely on fossil fuels forever. And if I'm in a group as large as this sometimes, I say to people, how many people believe that we need to move to wind energy? And they all put their hand up and say, we need to do it. But they always say a little rider to me, but not in my backyard. But anyway, we know there's stuff to be done the wind energy side and developments there. And of course, the offshore oil business is still pretty good and may become more promising. So the next 10 years will be really important for all of us in your communities, important for development, important for indigenous people too, both on the island of Newfoundland, of course, and in Labrador. So today we want to talk about United Declarations, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and support for reconciliation. I'm going to talk to you a bit about reconciliation. When Angelina comes up, she's going to tell you about the work that was done in the province where over more than 31 engagements occurred with people in communities, organizations, indigenous organizations, uh, Newfoundland Aboriginal Women's Network, Friendship Centers, and many others. And I'm looking forward to having that conversation uh, from her today. I had a conversation a few moments ago with Mayor Danny Breen from St. John's. He actually invited me to come to St. John's and meet with the council and talk about reconciliation there and what's happening from an indigenous perspective. I look forward to that. We have our own mayor, Jim Parsons from Corner right here. Mayor, mayor Parsons is a member of Hollywood First Nation. They just signed a, a declaration of their own uh, just this last week to have a land acknowledgement in front of every meeting they have to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people and to recognize the rich histories of the Beothic and the Innu and the Inuit people of Labrador. First time a year and a half ago, they began flying the Mi'kmaq flag and the atrium in Cornerbrook. Stephenville did it too. Other people are doing it in other communities. It's something that I would encourage you as, as mayors and deputy mayors and councilors to do. Pasadena did that last summer in a beautiful ceremony we had. So a lot is happening. There's a lot of recognition that's, that's coming for indigenous people. And we appreciate the opportunity. Yes, and we appreciate the respect that indigenous people are being given in Newfoundland and Labrador today. I'm going to begin by telling you a little something about Halibu First Nation. Some of you may Halibu have seen this before. means caribou. And like the caribou, generations of Mi'kmaq people have roamed far and wide, building what is the oldest living culture in Newfoundland. It's a culture that some of us have always lived. Some have lost and are reclaiming it again. And some are discovering for the first time. And while we find ourselves on our own unique points on this path of discovery, we are growing. Part of that growth means coming together as a community while educating our youth, learning from the wisdom of our elders, protecting our environment, promoting our tourism industry, building a strong economy, and inspiring the well-being of our people in mind, body, and spirit. We are a proud people, ever connected by the land, our past, and our future. A future we are building together. The word Mi'kmaq comes from the word Mi'kmaq, meaning my kin friends or allies. To our kin friends, our allies, know our strength as a community makes us stronger. Our connection is powerful. Our path is true. We are Halibu. So why United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous people? The General Assembly of the United Nations believed there were some important issues to be dealt with, not just in Canada, but around the world. Concerns that indigenous people have suffered from historic injustices as a result of colonization, dispossession of their lands, territories and resources, thus presenting them, preventing them from ex exercising in particular the right to development in accordance with their own needs and interests. 
The General Assembly also recognized the urgent need to respect and promote the inherent rights of indigenous peoples, which derive from their political, economic, and social structures and from their cultural, spiritual traditions, histories, and philosophies, especially their rights to their lands, territories, and resources. Additionally, they were convinced that the recognition of the rights of indigenous people in this declaration will enhance harmonious and cooperative relations between the state and indigenous peoples based on principles of justice, democracy, respect for human rights, non-discrimination, and good faith. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, I'll start calling it UNDRIP as a, an abbreviation, has a close connection to reconciliation. I'm gonna talk a bit about reconciliation in a little bit of time I have with you. So a reconciliation framework is one in which Canada's political and legal systems, educational and religious institutions, corporate sector and civil society function in ways that are consistent with the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP, which Canada has endorsed. UNDRIP is a framework for reconciliation in all levels and across all sectors of Canadian society. Surprisingly though, UNDRIP wasn't adopted in Canada until 2021. When it was previously put forward to the Conservative government under Stephen Harper, it was rejected. Canada did not come on, on come on board. It happened when Justin Trudeau became Prime Minister. And sadly also, there's only one province in Canada right now that has adopted UNDRIP, and that's British Columbia. No other province have done it. I had a meeting with the Premier last week. I raised this issue. I said, Premier, you have to consider adopting UNDRIP in this province. He said, we've been looking at it, but we're not there yet. So I said, get there yet. We need to do this. This is important. And we bring other provinces on board also across this country as we move into a, a new era of consideration for Indigenous people. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll keep trying and we'll keep the pressure on. As I mentioned a moment ago, UNDRIP wasn't about Canada. But it came in handy when we started talking about truth and reconciliation in this country in a big and meaningful way beginning in 2008. I'll give you a bit of history on that in a moment. Several countries, though, have been trying to move beyond the legacy of human rights abuses involving Native people and have undertaken truth-seeking and reconciliation efforts. Prominent among them is Australia. Governments and churches force assimilation and conversion to Christianity by placing children in training institutes become manual and domestic laborers. Malnutrition and sexual, sexual abuse were common. In New Zealand, education was used to civilize and convert Maori children as early as 1840. In Northern Europe, missionaries established Christian schools during the 17th century, encouraging the indigenous Sami people to give up their language. And it was a traumatic experience, traumatic experience for many. Beyond that, in Greenland, a little closer to home, Danish settlers established a community-based school system and boarding schools for the Inuit population, and both played a role in an attempt to erase Greenland's culture. These schools were initially run by the church. South Africa established a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 1995 to investigate human rights abuse during apartheid. The process featured testimony from people subject to torture themselves, and also some of the family members who were killed. So Truth and Reconciliation and the United Nations Declaration is not just about Canada. It's a universal document that covers indigenous people throughout the world. But because Truth and Reconciliation has become such an important topic in recent times, we now see a way to have UNDRIP adopted to support reconciliation in this country. And this conversation is gonna keep, keep going. So what is, what is truth and reconciliation? The truth side of truth and reconciliation is what has been happening or has happened and what is happening today in the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians, particularly what happened and is still happening in the relationship between Indigenous people and the federal, provincial, and yes, municipal governments and of course the churches. So what is reconciliation? Reconciliation is the acknowledgement and acceptance by all Canadians regarding what happened and is still happening 
in these relationships. In other words, the truth. And here's a key piece to reconciliation. Having the willingness for atonement. Moving forward in the spirit of mutual respect and positive change. I'll say it again. Moving forward in the spirit of mutual respect and positive change. We need more and more in that area. So that is a simple definition of truth and reconciliation. I tell people that the path of reconciliation has many, many steps. It's a long pathway. Do you think that our being here today together talking about truth and reconciliation might be a step in that pathway? Of course it is. Anywhere we would sit together, stand together and talk about reconciliation, it's an important step in a very long pathway. Now, will we ever get the true reconciliation? I don't know, not in my time. I figure it'll take years. I know where I'll be when it happens, if it happens. I'll be at Mount Patricia Cemetery in Corbrook with my parents, you know. But we have to keep trying. We have to keep moving forward, don't we? Canada Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TCR, was established in 2008 through a legal settlement between residential school survivors, the Assembly of First Nations, Inuit representatives, and the parties responsible for the creation and operation of residential schools, the federal government and church bodies. The conversation about truth and reconciliation began out of a concern of what happened in the residential school system. The TRC presented this final report at Parliament Hill, Ottawa in December of 2015. And I had the distinct honor to be in there. I was in Ottawa in a meeting. I was at visiting Goody Hutchings at her office at Parliament Hill. And she said, they're having a TCR presentation today. Barry Sinclair is there with the team. Would you like to go? I said, would I? It was a tremendously emotional event. I'm telling you, there weren't many dry eyes uh, when that happened. But it was an important milestone in the lives and the well-being of Indigenous people in this country, and particularly the children. And more and more is happening. There was just an announcement recently regarding a massive settlement in the tens of billions of dollars to give the children and their families. Indigenous children. A lot of them suffered a lot. I'll tell you about that in a moment. Residential schools were religious-based institutions established by the Canadian government in the 19th and 20th century. From 1831 to 1996, there were 139 residential schools in Canada. The goals of these schools was to assimilate people. I'm not too good at moving the slides either. So children were taken from their families and communities and sent to live in the schools, often for years at a time. These children were subjected to physical, emotional, and sexual abuse and were denied access to their cultural heritage and language. The intent here was to kill the Indian and the child. Now, in all fairness, I have spoken to people who thought they enjoyed residential school. One was a, a well-known uh, nun, a sister in Nova Scotia, who told me she got an education there. But I talked to others who got nothing there, only hard work working in the laundry, cooking in the kitchen. They never got much of an education at all. And it was a very difficult time for them because they couldn't see their families, couldn't talk to their siblings who were in the same residential school. And yes, I heard about the abuse, emotional, physical, and sexual that some of these people endured. Approximately 160,000 children were forced to attend residential school. Approximately 6,000 children died while attending residential schools. As of January 2023, 2,472 suspected unmarked graves have been discovered on the grounds of former residential schools in Canada. Residential schools were characterized, they're still characterized today when people talk of it. Forced assimilation, separation from family, poor quality of life, subject to nutritional experiments. Unbelievable, isn't it? They would take the children and, and have nutritional experience with them. Cruel punishments, sexual abuse, frequent student deaths, failure to provide adequate education and training, occasional resistance by students, and cycles of family abuse over generations. I was in a meeting in Ottawa one time, and this was a, a lady I was speaking with, a very prominent Canadian lady. And she told me that she was watching the Truth and Reconciliation presentation. She said, to my absolute surprise, my father was sitting in the front row. She said he never ever spoke about residential school. And she said to me, hmm, now I know why he always seems so cold to us. He never really could, we never could really feel the love. He never hugged us. He never, we never felt it like some children and parents had that sense of connection between them. 
And uh, when she talked to her mother, she said, yes, her father was in a residential school. Well, maybe that's part of, of the way he is and the way he, he interacted with, with all of you. So these were, uh, you know, difficult times and yes, terrifying times. For the sake of time, I could talk all day about the stories I heard about residential school. So the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was presented in 2015, included 10 principles for reconciliation and 94 calls to action as a way of moving forward with the reconciliation process. And I'll share this with you. The report was presented in 2015 in December out of 95 or 94 calls to action. There haven't been many taken care of yet. There's a lot of work left undone. When I think about the report on missing and murdered women, 232 calls of action. They haven't got through 20 of them yet. So we've been taking our time in this country with moving forward with some of these things. But little by little, you know, we're, we're going to keep at it. These are the three people that were involved in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Murray Sinclair, former senator, retired now. Chief Wilton Littlechild, this is a man I know. I spoke with him just recently in, in, in Ottawa at a meeting of the Assembly First Nation and Dr. Murray Wilson. They traveled around the country and had thousands of interviews with people. And anyway, in, in that process, in the conversation around uh, truth and reconciliation, uh, Murray Sinclair uh, put out this video. I don't know who got control of playing it. Is it me? Yes. Can you turn this up a little bit, please? Hello, everybody. I'm Murray Sinclair. I'm the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the issue of reconciliation, something which, of course, is very important to us here at the commission, but also is of interest and importance to a lot of people in Canada. One of the things that we at the commission have discovered is that it took us a long time to get to this point in terms of the relationship between Aboriginal people in this country. Seven generations of children went through the residential schools, and each of those children who were educated were told that their lives were not as good as the lives of the non-Aboriginal people of this country. They were told that their languages, their cultures were irrelevant. They were told that their people and their ancestors were heathens and pagans and uncivilized and needed to give up that way of life to come to a different way of living. At the same time that that was going on, non-Aboriginal children in the non-Aboriginal school systems of this country were also being told the same thing about Aboriginal people. So as a result, many generations of children, including you and your parents, have been raised to think about things in, the, in a different way, in the wrong way, in a way that is negative when it comes to Aboriginal people. And we need to change that. It was the educational system that has contributed to this problem in this country. And it's the educational system we believe that's going to help us to get away from this. We need to look at the way that we educate children. We need to look at the way that we educate ourselves. We need to look at what it is that our textbooks say about Aboriginal people. We need to look at what it is that Aboriginal people themselves are allowed to say within the educational system about their own histories. In addition to that, we also believe that what's important when it comes to looking at the way that children are educated is to understand that because it took us so many generations to get to this point, it's going to take us at least a few generations to be able to say that we are making progress. We cannot look for quick and easy solutions because there are none. We need to be able to look at this from the perspective of where do we want to be in three or four or five or seven generations from now when we talk about the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in this country. And if we can agree on what that relationship needs to look like in the future, then what we need to think about is what can we do today that will contribute to that objective? Reconciliation will be about ensuring that everything that we do today is aimed at that high standard of restoring that balance to that relationship. So truth and reconciliation in, in summing up here promotes the belief that confronting and reckoning with past actions and relationships are necessary for successful transition from conflict, mistreatment, resentment, and tension to a state of peace, respect, and improved relations. Senator Marie Sinclair, Chairperson of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, stated, for reconciling to work, for, to work and for our relationship to be renewed, there must be awareness, acceptance, apology, atonement, and action. 
We don't say reconciliation too much anymore. We're looking to a new term now. It's called reconciliation. We can talk to her blue in the face about reconciliation. What do we need to do? We need to do something about it, don't we? We do need to do something about it in your communities too, in your roles, where this kind of, of thing needs to be brought to the forefront. We need to do away with discrimination and, and racism. And it's happening more and more. When I think about what we're doing in Canada today in Newfoundland, we're bringing people into our province and our country from everywhere. People of different color, different religions, different languages. We always have to be considerate of these people and not turn our back on these people and not turn these people away and down. Very important for us to treat people fairly. The truth, this is the truth. Avoidance is not a pathway to reconciliation. Reconciliation requires sincere and respectful engagement. And I'll share with you that reconciliation can be in many places in many different forms. You may need reconciliation in your home if you had an argument with your spouse. You know, I, I see that happen. A good friend of mine never spoke to his wife for two days one time. And I went there and I, she came in and went out again. I said, what's going on? He said, well, we've been fighting. We, I haven't spoken to her in two days. I said, you need to fix that. You can't keep this up. You know, or a child that says to its parent, I hate you because they can't get their way opportunity for reconciliation and where does reconciliation begin it begins inside of each one of us all starts in here so there's a lot of work left to be done in our communities in our province in our country with respect to reconciliation i heard a conversation earlier from dr parfrey about the medical situation and some people brought up examples of the difficulty they're having in certain parts of our province particularly in labrador indigenous people there have to be treated maybe a little differently or with a little more sensitivity than has been experienced in, in the past. You know, I read about stories about people go to the hospital, indigenous people and get turned away. You know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this country too, with respect to police forces and indigenous people, RCMP. Yes. Even Roland Falanca Savary. I've just been invited to sit on a national advisory board to the commissioner of, of the RCMP. I can't wait to go there. It's an indigenous advisory board, you know, there's uh, all kinds of, uh, of things that are happening there. And people have a lot of resentment in our communities for the RCMP. And it goes back uh, a, a very long way. It just didn't happen yesterday. I'll finish by making a few final comments. I have a, a document here that was prepared for me. And I'll finish by saying, as members of the Mi'kmaq Nation of Newfoundland, we possess inherent rights, just as we do all do at this assembly as First Nations. I gave this conversation at the National Assembly just recently in Ottawa. These are rights that have been given to us by the Creator and only for us as First Nations to self-determine based on our unique histories and experiences. They come from within us, from our heritage and our ancestors. They're not delegated to us by any government. These are inherent rights. The Office of the Regional Chief, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, started engaging with the Mi'kmaq of Dagenkoke, the Isle of Newfoundland, on UNDRIP back in October of 2022. Over 30 engagement sessions were held in person and virtually with our communities, and we heard from over 500 participants. This is the starting point of a long-term initiative. The Big Bob Newfoundland have identified 16 specific action plan priorities for inclusion in the action plan, and these are the priorities that rank the highest, and you're going to hear from them in a moment from Angelina MRL. When I think back on the history of Newfoundland Mi'kmaq people and indigenous people generally in Newfoundland and Labrador, in 1949, Joseph Smallwood was a premier at the time. I said, oh, he was a premier. Yeah, he was a prime minister, a premier. He was asked by the federal government, were there any Indians in Newfoundland? And his response was, no, there aren't any. Damn, indigenous people in Mi'kmaq here are dating back to the 1400s. And the first recordings of engagement with indigenous people, Mi'kmaq people particularly, by outsiders, Europeans, 1600s and 1700s. And, uh, you know, that situation with, with Joseph Smallwood in saying that, I could speculate on why he did it. One answer would be, he was trying to get Newfoundland to join Confederation. He had a lot of trouble getting Newfoundlanders to give up their connection to, the, to England. He really did. And 
He needed to vote. And what couldn't indigenous people do back in 1949? They couldn't vote. So if Joe Smallwood has said, I have a whole bunch of indigenous people here. Yes, I do. There's several thousand of them. Canada would have said, name them. And where are they? He needed everybody to vote. The other thing, of course, that would have came into play had he said, yes, there's a backload of indigenous people in Newfoundland. Canada then would have to negotiate a deal with these people. And that would have taken a hell of a long time. And Joseph Smallwood was in a hurry to join Confederation. Those are a couple of the possibilities as to why he told people. He knew there were indigenous people here, but we paid dearly for that for such a long time. And, uh, and sadly, though, you know, indigenous people, both on the island and in Labrador, we're kind of getting our win right now. Like I told you, the way people, the way indigenous people feel about themselves is different than it was back in 1949 and, and 2000 and all those other years that came. It's been an interesting, I'd say for me, 11 years now on council, first as a counselor. I'm in my seventh year as chief of Halibut First Nation. And we've come a long way in a short time. We celebrate our 12th anniversary in September. And we look forward to what the next 10 years are going to bring us. I think we're going to grow and develop exponentially. We'll be, we won't be struggling in the way we did 30, 40 years ago. And again, back in the early 1970s, when there was a movement of foot in the province to try to get recognition for Mi'kmaq people. And yes, at the time, the people of Labrador. And as history had it, the Labrador people moved away from the Native Association of Newfoundland and Labrador and weren't part of the Federation of Newfoundland Indians. And the Con River Band left the Federation of Newfoundland Indians in 1982 and became a reserve in 1987. But since that time, right up to 2009, when a ratif agreement, ratification agreement was meet with Canada, there was a lot of decades of struggle trying to get recognition. The deal we made isn't perfect, but we are here. And we do appreciate the numbers of indigenous people are around in our communities. And Halibut First Nation is here to support our people in our communities in any way we can. It's about improving people's lives like you do. Work collaboratively to create a better tomorrow for all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. And this is what you do in your work as mayors, deputy mayors and counselors and administrators. And I thank you for all that. And now we'll ask Angelina Amaral to come to the podium here and tell you about the results of what was uh, discussed. Thank you very much, Regional Chief. So hello, everyone. I just wanted to, uh, so my name is Angelina. I am a Mi'kmaq lawyer. I'm from Con River, Newfoundland. And I'm gonna introduce myself the way that uh, we traditionally do. So um, I've already mentioned my place. So we always identify where we're from. So Con River. My family in Con, because we are a kinship society, are the Johns and the Joes. So now, now that lets others from within our culture know where we are placed, because we are family-based. And the name that the spirits know me by is Red Thunder Woman. So now you also know what I bring for our nation. So that's a lot of information if you know how to read it, but traditionally that's how we would introduce ourselves so that now people can place who we are, where we are, and what group we belong to. Um, so going into a little bit more about the history of Tahamakuk. So one of the things that, um, and as uh, regional chief has mentioned, truth and reconciliation has to start with truth before we can start reconciling. So we need to bring these things forward. And as we were doing our engagements, we heard a lot about sharing our history because as the regional chief mentioned, we were completely left out of the history of this province, completely ignored when Joey Smallwood said, as the regional chief mentioned, there are no Indians in Newfoundland. This meant that our, us as First Nations could not access any programs, services, or resources that other First Nations across Canada could access. It also meant that we did not exist in law. We were not covered under any mainstream laws. We were not covered under the Indian Act now. We were nothing and nowhere. So as time went on, Regional Chief has mentioned, you know, the forced removal of our children, where our children from our communities were also removed. We may not have had a residential school here within the island of Newfoundland, but within my community, our children, once you turn 10, you went to a boarding school, including my own mother. 
So she had to leave home. The only difference was if your family could go get you, you were allowed to come home for the weekends. That's the only difference between the boarding schools that we had and the residential schools. The abuses, everything that you heard, same thing. On the West Coast, it wasn't necessarily that people were being taken and removed and put in boarding schools, but we heard a lot of stories of indigenous Mi'kmaq children being removed from their families and put in orphanages, lost. So these things did happen with us. Also along the way, and you heard the regional chief mentioned, our way of life became criminalized. We were not protected under mainstream law. We were not Indians under the Indian Act. We did not exist. So when we went out on the land, we're now being charged, but we can't get jobs. We can't get the money. We, can't, we have to live off the land. Now, when we try to survive, we're charged. Many of our men who are our providers, criminalized, thrown in jail, increased car incarceration rates. The results of all this has been, you know, a long, hard history for our people here on the island, but it's been discrimination and loss. That's what we've experienced to this point. You know, we lost our identity. We lost uh, our language. We lost who we are. And we also lost our connections with our Mi'kmaq cousins in the rest of Mi'kmaq and of our territory. And we wanted to share that history with you to let you know why the action items that have come forward are important to the Mi'kmaq of Takamakuk. So as we go through, we must mention that um, our engagements only focused on the island of Newfoundland and the First Nations on the island. So that would be the Mi'kmaq. So this does not cover the Innu and it does not cover the Inuit. The, the Innu are covered by the Regional Office for Quebec and Labrador. So they would have a different report and the Inuit are covered by ITK. So they have a different report and a different uh, way of doing things. So this is just what we've heard for on the island for the Mi'kmaq of Newfoundland. So we did do, um, so Regional uh, had mentioned that um, Canada finally endorsed UNDRIP and it's now in domestic law. So even though it was passed back in 2007 by the assembly, the Ge UN General Assembly, our nation, the Mi'kmaq nation actually adopted UNDRIP into our Mi'kmaq law in 2008. Our Mi'kmaq nation was one of the first nations to be on the forefront of this fight. And we actually took Canada to the UN Commission on Human Rights for violating our rights. What ended up happening in 1980 when the constitutional development was happening is that um, as we went through that, it took about 10 years to go through this UN process, you know, violating our rights. The UN looked at our nation, our Grand Chief and our Keji Sakamo, and uh, they said, um, yep, the federal government has violated your rights. The problem is you are not the right type of people. We were not covered. No Indigenous person across the world was covered under the UN Convention on their rights. No human rights laws applied to Indigenous peoples was the end result of that. That happened in 1991 when that decision came down. So then began the drafting of the UN Convention on the Rights of Indigenous People. That was the really big start to it that brought everyone together. And then in 27, 2007, the UN Assembly, our nation adopted it. And it wasn't until 2016, as a regional chief mentioned, that Harper finally endorsed it. That didn't mean it applied in Canada. It didn't actually apply to Canada and Canadian law until 2021. So those are the pro that's the process of it. So this law is really important to us. Well, the declaration, but it now has the force of law in Canada, which is great. Um, so what this declaration does, it sets out the minimum standard of the rights of Indigenous peoples in any country. So this is the minimum of what things should be is what's in the declaration. Now, every country can, you know, step it up a bit, be nice. But the least you can do is give us what's in uh, the UN Declaration. The UN Declaration also does not create any new rights, none. And this is very important to us because our argument as Indigenous peoples from all over the world was that we have always had these rights. You've heard the regional chief mention, we have inherent rights. They don't come from anyone. They don't come from a crown. They don't come from anywhere. They come from our creator given to us as a result of our heritage, our culture, and being a part of this land. So our goal, <laughs> after all that, was to go around and engage our communities to find out what are their priorities. 
So now the federal government has three legal obligations that they have to do in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples. The and these line up with our priorities. So the first one is to create a national UNDRIP action plan of the types of actions that are going to be taken. The second one that the federal government has to do is that all their laws and policies, all 900 and some, have to be in line with UNDRIP and the principles and values that are in there. So every federal law and policy has to be reviewed, as well as any future ones created have to be in line. The last thing that the federal government has to do is a uh, report on their progress every year through a parliamentary report that has to be tabled. So those were the three things that we wanted to engage our community members on to find out what their priorities were in order to inform the federal government in completing or fulfilling their legal obligations to our people. So we did this by hosting rounds of engagement. We did two rounds. I'm just gonna flick to the next one. So let you know. So we did every single one of these twice, every dot, every location. And the actual team that was a part of that, if I can go back, and it was the three of us. So the lovely Risha not here kept us on task, organized, you know, had our communications going. People knew what was going on. We had Keith Cormier with us, amazing, fantastic fellow. And he was our runner. And he really did a lot of the going into community and hosting the engagements and collecting the information. And then uh, myself, and I just sort of helped with uh, bringing together the content and pulling together a report. So that's our little team that went along. And we traveled to every single one of these, Keith doing most of the traveling, but this, these were our UNDRIP engagement activities. So the very first thing we did was hold a training for our staff. Our training was done by Sagage Henderson. I'm not sure if any of you know of him, but he is also the uh, legal counsel for our Mi'kmaq Grand Council. And he was also a part of uh, taking Canada to the UN as well as drafting the convention, the declaration. So two training sessions with him to make sure that we were on the right page. We created a number of educational materials to pump out into the communities. Then we held, as Regional Chief mentioned, over 30 different engagement, in-person engagement sessions, as well as a virtual one for those people who could not make. So all of this is about inclusion. We wanted to hear from as many people as we could. So we also held a virtual engagement session for those who couldn't attend one of the uh, community meetings or who were not living in the province. So at that session, we had people from BC to Newfoundland all over. So that was really great. We held a two-day UNDRIP forum that was done in St. John's. It was just two days specifically talking about UNDRIP. We also completed a survey where as we got action items, we then pushed those back out to everyone so that they could rank them. What's your priority? What do you see as first, second, third? So we also did that. We created an interim report for the federal government for back in December. This is where the regional chief is getting 16 action items. But since our round two in, of engagement, so when we went back out, we said, all right, this, these are the action items that we heard. Is that everything? Do you want more? So we're, now we're actually up to 22. So a few more have been added since then. But we wanted to share you know, what we did through our engagements and where we did them. And that's a picture from our two-day uh, forum in St. John's where we did the policy. It was great. It was actually really nice. I enjoyed that one. And now, so what did we actually hear? So as I'm going through some of these, and I just want to go through them with you, because really we are here today to build a relationship and to see if there's anything that, you know, maybe resonates with one of you guys. Uh, is there something that you'd like to take part in? Is, you know, is there another idea? Anything like that. But to go through some of the things that we heard, so we do have 22 action plan priorities that were identified by the Mi'kmaq of Tahamakuk. One of the things that we recognize, and as the regional chief has mentioned, this is a long-term vision, a long-term thing. This is gonna take many generations. So as we were doing our engagements, a lot of the participants took it as, we're here to build the best foundation we can for our Mi'kmaq youth and the next generations to come who will take this work and move it forward. Because we know we're not gonna do everything, but where are those stones that we can start putting down where we can have a footing? So that's really how we approached it with all of our engagements. And this is the feedback that we received. So major priority for the Mi'kmaq of Tahamakuk, all around reconnecting. 
So bringing us back together. So creating opportunities and providing resources for the Mi'kmaq to reconnect as a nation at the local, regional, and national levels of Mi'kmaq governance. So within our communities, within our districts, and within Mi'kmaq, our entire ter our territory. And just in case you don't know, Mi'kmaq, our territory actually includes parts of Newfoundland, uh, PEI, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, St. Pierre, Miquelon, and down in parts of Maine. That's our entire territory. So we are divided among many lines. So we want to come together, all of us, to create opportunities and provide resources for Mi'kmaq leadership, our leadership across our territory to come together to discuss and identify Mi'kmaq protocol standards and how we can uphold those. To create opportunities to provide resources for Mi'kmaq leadership of Tahamakup, so just our leadership here within Newfoundland to come together to discuss and identify areas of common interest, including policy, legislative concerns, and strategic development, because we are one nation. We also are going to call on the federal government to provide resources of Mi'kmaq to create a Mi'kmaq Nation UN Declaration Action Plan, because one of them has committed to is a distinctions-based approach. Well, distinctions-based is not Inuit and First Nations and Métis, Within First Nations, there are over 634 different nations from BC to here. We are all very distinct. So we are asking the federal government when they come into Newfoundland, treat this distinctly. We are not the same as every other First Nation. We have a very different history. So that's um, what we are gonna be asking of them. And we're also asking uh, for the federal government to provide resources to support the implementation of the UN declaration in Newfoundland at the provincial and municipal levels. So if the province or municipality does want to ally and see if we can do something together, then the federal government should be providing us with resources and supporting us to do that. Other areas um, that were of importance, and this was a big one that came up all the time, is that for the federal government and the provincial government of Newfoundland and Labrador to acknowledge the historical and just unjust treatment of the Mi'kmaq of Tahmacook and enter into nation-to-nation -nation discussions on federal recognition, ban creation policies, and the implementation of Mi'kmaq citizenship codes and processes for identifying who is Mi'kmaq, because we already have ways of doing that for ourselves. So these really go to self-determination, self-governance, and uh, recognition. Um, we would also like for the federal government and anyone else <laughs> um, to recognize that injustice, violence, racism, discrimination, and prejudice are hate crimes and should be communicated and treated as such. That these, these types of treatments have to end and we really have to put them as a hate crime and see it for what it truly is. Um, other areas that were came up as priorities, of course, is a recognition of Mi'kmaq use and stewardship responsibilities of Mi'kmaq lands, waters, territories, and resources in Tahamakot. Um, to have resources and capacity building for the Mi'kmaq of Tahmacook to be able to uh, adequate, adequately protect established and possible archaeological sites within our province and establish a treaty and Aboriginal rights research center for the Mi'kmaq of Tahmacook. We are the only area that does not have an Aboriginal and rights, a Tara Center, treaty and Aboriginal rights research center for the Indigenous people of the province. Um, so we are, you know, we'd like to have one of those. Um, also, we would like, uh, you know, for our Mi'kmaq cultural artifacts and properly held by an archive, a museum, a family, or an individual to come back to us. And for those things that are originated from here in Newfoundland to come back to Newfoundland so that we have them here. I know um, within our community, we are trying to get one of our peaked caps brought back from uh, Australia that was taken in the 1800s from our community. Um, so things like that, so that we can bring our history back. Um, so that uh, they provide, so the, for the federal government to provide resources and support opportunities for Mi'kmaq youth, individuals and groups to engage with their cultural teachings and traditional activities and sports, including those that are based on the lands and the waters. A lot of the things we did was always tied to the land and always tied to the water. Um, to provide adequate resources for the Mi'kmaq of Tahamakuk to revive and promote the Mi'kmaq language across Newfoundland, which may include support for immersion programs, renaming places, and adding traditional names to signage across the province. 
Um, another one is also has to do with education and being able to tell our history. So we want to have Mi'kmaq led curriculum development and educational campaigns where we're bringing our history and telling our stories. We also wanted adequate resources to fully develop and sustain Mi'kmaq institutions. The first institution that the Mi'kmaq of Tahmacook wanted to build was uh, a justice, was their main one, which doesn't surprise me because it's typically been the justice system that has uh, done a lot of damage to our nation. So justice was the big one that they wanted to look on and to design a system that upholds Mi'kmaq laws, protocols, principles, and uh, values. Another thing that they really wanted was to create and maintain a Mi'kmaq ethics board for research that's being conducted within Newfoundland. We don't have one of those. Uh, within Nova Scotia, the Mi'kmaq Grand Council, there is actually called the Mi'kmaq Ethics Watch. And any university that's going to be doing research in our communities, on our people, has to apply through there. And it's our Mi'kmaq Grand Council that watches that and approves or, you know, gets people to tweak their projects and really think about things. So that was another one that uh, we thought should be here in Newfoundland as well. To provide resources specific for the Mi'kmaq to, de to develop and deliver, you know, health services and programs that reflect our culture, our medicines, so that we can actually see ourselves when we go into these buildings. To develop a trilateral table to explore creative solutions for the Mi'kmaq of Tahomecook to access a basic standard of housing, food security, and drinking water. And to increase resources, education, and access to programs uh, specific to resolving gender-based violence, implementing the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls calls to justice, and supporting 2SGLBTQQAI plus initiatives. So we want the federal government to provide more resources to our communities so we can support specific communities that we have within ours. So the last couple big things, and these are uh, really good ones. So specifically around implementation, it was um, to provide resources to, to establish a permanent UN declaration office in Newfoundland. This office would work on behalf of the Mi'kmaq of Tahomecook. The office would provide ongoing administrative support, communications, and capacity building on the declaration to leadership, organizations, community members, and anyone who, would, who wants access, who wants to learn about it, who wants to work with our community members. So now there's a point of contact and then we can share it out. The other one is to provide resources to hold biannual UN declaration symposiums just in Newfoundland, so not this national stuff. We want our own for our own region. And um, this is where, at these symposiums, where we could share updates on activities. So if groups are working together, they could be invited in to share the things that they are doing. And we would also identify new priorities because we don't want to be stagnant. We don't want to get locked into this action plan that never changes because that's just never works. And um, so identify new priorities and provide capacity building around UNDRIP so that we can keep this work going. And then, and actually that, um, this, these last two actually came from a youth at a flat bay where they saw this office being there. And then they were like, and then you can hire youth and then we can do your media. And I'm like, oh my God, let me write this down. So these are one of the youth ideas. And then they really wanted people to come together to hear from the federal government. So these symposiums are more for like feds, come here. What have you done in your action plan? What have you done for us? So it's another means of holding them accountable, but as well as opening it up to let's hear what others have done. So those, and then the last one, this is a big one, a commitment of adequate support, resources and funding by the federal government for implementing the UN declaration in Newfoundland and Labrador. So those were uh, the top priorities that the Mi'kmaq of Tahomecook had uh, identified. And then there's a little bit around consistency of law. So we did go through not all 900, but I did whittle them down a bit. So we went through about 400 actually. And um, as they were going through, these were their top laws. They said, you know what? Anything that has to do with hunting, fishing, harvesting, any law that touches on that needs to be looked at. Also, an environmental assessments, ATR is additions to reserves um, and Reserve Creation Act. So that's another law that the feds have that they're currently going to open up within the next few months. So that is uh, a possibility. The one that's not on there, and I left it off because it's obvious, but maybe it's not so obvious, um, is the Indian Act. <laughs> 
just because that is one of the most discriminatory pieces of legislation that has ever been created. And it was done to basically control every aspect of our lives. So that's one that we want open to start really looking at. The Criminal Justice Act, as well as the Department of Justice Act. And then somebody said, you know what? Any law that's over nine, older than 1999, because there were so many of them. And then new federal laws, and the regional chief has mentioned policing. So the feds are creating a, you know, First Nations policing as an essential service law legislation. So that's going to create a legislative framework for that. And the federal government is also going to be starting a First Nations health law. I'm not sure what that name is, but that's just in its beginnings. So we want to take part in those and provide input into that as well. So going forward, what we're really asking for is like to ensure that um, that we create internal institutions. That this is why they really want it like a permanent undrift office. We need to build things that are into the system so that it stays because this is long-term work. Um, we, they also talked about creating tables of Mi'kmaq scholars and lawyers to discuss the laws and actions where our own experts come together. Where there is no... One of the things that happened this time around is that there, as I mentioned, our nation is divided by many borders and provinces. Um, what the feds did is even though we were all Mi'kmaq and we were, you know, sort of working together, they had each of us under a non-disclosure agreement. We couldn't talk to one another to the point where our office, every time we met with the feds, we would be like, we're going to talk to this group. We're going to talk to that group. The federal government finally told us, fine, go ahead. Because we were already, you know, we have to talk to one another. So we want no non-disclosure agreements so that our tables can actually speak openly and freely to discuss things. Um, federal um, presentations at the uh, biannual UNDRIP uh, symposiums that I had mentioned and a uh, commitment of money. But when it comes to the annual reports, one of the things that was really focused on by throughout the engagements was the importance of insurance. So not necessarily what was in there. You know, people were like, yeah, we want to know what actions were taken, you know, what actions were achieved, what barriers did, you know, the federal government face, and then what remedial action did they take or are planning to take to address that barrier overall. But one of the main focuses of the annual report was access. People wanted to make sure that community members, youth, elders, everyone could access the information in the reports, as well as be able to understand the information in the reports and be able to provide ongoing input into this process. So those were the main uh, real concerns about the, um, the annual reporting. And some of the things that they had thought about was that the federal government should introduce monthly notices that they could push out. Uh, quarterly updates, a little bit more detailed, and of course, presentations, full-on presentations at those summits if they're created. Um, they also talked about providing resources to hold UN declaration presentations in the school systems throughout the province, as well as, you know, if you're going to create these, I don't know about you guys, but Il News 10, Il News, so Il New in our language just means Indigenous, means people. Um, so Il News tend to be very visual. We like, we see things. We're visual and auditory learners. All this written report, that's nice, you know. <laughs> you guys know what things look like when they're tabled at Parliament. Are you really going to take that and bring it to youth? And, you know, so we talked about um, creating a visual of that report, creating audio representations of the report so that that information can be shared. So that is what we heard throughout uh, Tahomokok from the Mi'kmaq. And with that, I will pass it back to the regional chief. See if there's any questions or how we want to do this. Thank you, Angelina. Thank you. As you can see from the summary that Angelina presented, there has been a lot of great work done in our communities. Spread a word about UNDRIP and talk about reconciliation. Uh, I think we have a better sense of where we're headed right now as an indigenous group in this province and again i think the indigenous people of canada have a greater sense of themselves also than what we had i just said before i get down i just want to thank uh, amy cody and, and rob for inviting us to be here uh we've certainly enjoyed it here today thank all of you for your attention and i'll say to you again 
keep up the great work you're doing on behalf of your people and your communities. They need you. You are appreciated. And thank you. Walaliu. I'm not sure if anybody has a question, but we'll certainly entertain any questions or comments that you'd like to have. I know time is going. I think we overstepped our time so far by six minutes. But if anybody has something to, to ask, certainly by all means. There is a nutrition break now, so you're not missing another session. If you did have a question, you can certainly just ask. Okay. Again, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your weekend here. I wish you a successful next couple of days. I hope you're productive and, uh, and you take away from here something that can help you uh, even make your own communities more prosperous and, and better places to live for your citizens. Thank you very much. We'll all you.